Hello everyone and welcome back. I hope you took that five minute break and feeling refreshed. Uh, let's get started in page 381 in pediatrics uh, uh, section, Master of the Boards, step three. We have respiratory disease here and we can see a table, a very big table that takes the whole page. And uh, we're gonna talk about three major conditions here, which is croup, uh, epiglottitis, and bacterial uh, trichitis, or trichitis in general and uh, tracheal bronchi um, bronchitis um, and those are the three main respiratory disease that we need to uh, to address here and then we're gonna have uh, multiple other diseases I'm gonna try my best here to do respiratory disease in one session we're gonna finish it either way if we um, go past the 25 minutes that that's gonna be fine but we're gonna try to finish respiratory disease all together uh, together here right away okay Okay, let's start in the table here with the first uh, condition, which is croup. Uh, the croup here is caused by the parainfluenza 1 or 3, or the influenza A or B. Uh, it should be noted that the parainfluenza is an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. However, the influenza is an RNA virus of the family orthomyxoviridae. Uh, uh, and uh, this is going to be helpful if you've took uh, step one before, but if you haven't, please know those information. It might help a little bit in the exam. So the parainfluenza is uh, one uh, type one or two, and influenza type A or B. The parainfluenza is an enveloped single stranded RNA. They, uh, the influenza is an RNA virus of the family Orthomyxoviridae. Okay, how about the presentation? The classic presentation in, in uh, such case uh, is going to be a child aged three months to five years uh, with upper respiratory tract infection symptoms uh, like rhinorrhea, sore throat, hoarseness, and deep barking. That's, that's the buzzword here, deep barking cough, um, and respiratory strider and the kidney. The symptoms are going to be worse at night. To diagnose such a case, um, it's going to be it's going to be done clinically. However, we can do a neck X-ray. Uh, it's going to be positive for steeple uh, sign. Uh, this can be diagnostic. I don't think that this is something that you're going to do or order in the exam. It's going to be clinically mainly, but just in case, if you see something like that, uh, please do so. Uh, just recognize it. I um, I've never seen such a case before. I um, I'm not really a pediatrician, so um, if um, if you can comment below with in an x-ray that uh, shows that sign, that would be really helpful. All right. Okay, so we diagnosed that case. How are we going to manage it? Uh, the steps of management first is going to be hum humidified oxygen. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, also given nebulized epinephrine and corticosteroids, and this is going to help the uh, the, uh, the presentation here. Uh, Antitussives, decongestants, uh, sedatives, or antibiotics are not used in the management of croup. And this is really important because this is kind of like a common mistake to give antitussives because he's coughing and a decongestant because he has sore throat and so on and uh, our rhinorrhea and antibiotics are not really going to do anything it's a virus so um, do not use those in management of croup here so just humidified oxygen nebulized epinephrine and corticosteroids are going to help um, the complications or the prognosis here uh, usually it's going to be a spontaneous resolution within one week and we always suspect the diagnosis of epiglottitis because of course epiglottitis is a major problem it is actually an emergency and we should suspect that in case of croup as well and excluded okay when having said epiglottitis let's just jump into this and epiglottitis is caused by either h influenza uh, type b uh, but now it's less common, uh, but it could be strep pigeons, uh, pneumo, pneumonia, strep pneumonia, or staph aureus, and, uh, and mycoplasma. So, um, again, it's influenza type B, and this is now less common, and other, st other uh, types of bacteria. So it's a bacteria infection, let's just establish that. Uh, but it could also be um, strep pigeons, uh, strep pneumonia, and staph aureus or mycoplasma. Uh, a note here, again, it says that each of the ones in a ne gram-negative cocobacilli, okay, and the staph pneumonia is a gram-positive alpha-hemolytic uh, bacterium. The staph pigeon is the gram-positive uh, caucus that causes group A streptococcal infection. Again, we, had, we talked about three, uh, three 
um, uh, bacteria here. The first is H. influenza, and the important part is that it's gram-negative and cocobacilli. And then we talked about the strep nemo, and this is a gram-positive and alpha-hemolytic bacteria. Uh, please refer to microbiology if you would like to know more about that. And finally, we said the staph pyogens, which is the gram-positive cocci, that causes the strep A streptococcal infection, group A streptococcal infection. All right? All right. So how about the classic presentation here? What we're going to see in a patient who has epiglottitis? First is going to be a sudden onset. Very important, sudden onset, a muffled voice, drooling, dysphagia, high fever, and inspiratory strider. Inspiratory strider. Uh, the patient prefers sitting in the tripod position, and the patient has a toxic appearance. So, sudden onset, muffled voice, drooling, dysphagia, high fever, and inspiratory strider here. Okay, uh, the diagnosis, well, this is a medical emergency here. We go straight to management based on clinical diagnosis. Um, performing diagnostic workup is going to be after stabilization. We can do the neck x-ray. We're going to see the thumbprint sign. Um, we can do blood cultures for the, um, for the bacteria. And... Um, and uh, we can do a nasopharyngoscopy uh, 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 in the OR, and finally an epiglottic swab, uh, swab uh, culture. Uh, but again, the, the important part here is not what the diagnostic workup is, but it has to do with after stabilization. That's very important. Okay, so. Speaking of this, what is going to be the management? The first thing is going to transfer the patient to the hospital or the OR. We're going to consult an ENT and an anesthesiologist, a specialist. We're going to intubate the patient. We give antibiotics, probably ceftriaxone and steroids. We give a rifampin prophylaxis to household contacts if H. influenza is positive. But this is actually after the, the swap and the blood culture and so on. Uh, the complication that we might suspect in such cases is going to be airway obstruction and death. And that's why we intubate the patient. Why That's why it's a medical emergency and so on. Okay. Now it's been epiglottitis here. <clears throat> Finally, it's going to be bacterial trichitis. And uh, the organism is Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a gram-positive cauc uh, caucus uh, that causes uh, that occurs in clusters. Okay, so Staph aureus. The classic presentation is going to brassy cough. I don't really know the difference between brassy cough and uh, barking cough and so on, but it just it's it's the buzzword here. Um, anyway, it's going to be cough in general, high fever. Uh, respiratory distress, but no drooling or dysphagia, which differentiates it uh, from, again, epiglottitis. That's really important, okay? Epiglottitis is going to have the drooling and the dysphagia. Uh, the child is going to be less than three years of age, usually occurs after a viral upper respiratory tract infection. Um, the diagnosis is going to be clinical, because plus we can do a laryngoscopy. Um, we can do also a chest x-ray, which will show a subglottic narrowing, uh, plus the rigged tracheal air column, uh, ragged or something like that. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The, uh, it's an R-A-G-G-E-D, uh, tracheal air column, and uh, blood cultures and throat cultures, of course. The, the management is going to be anti-staph uh, antibiotics, and we can sometimes intubate the patient if it's, it is severe. Yeah, the case is fair enough. The complication is going to be airway obstruction. But this is uh, different from epiglottitis, is that it's not a medical emergency. Okay, so we're done with that uh, table here. And let's move to the next page. Um, and the next page starts with clues to less common disorders here. Okay, so um, before that, in the left side, we have a note that says differentiate epiglottitis from croup by the absence of a barking cough. So that's how we differentiate both, a barking cough. All right, so again, clues to less common disorders. So if we have a um, diphtheritic croup, uh, we have dif uh, diphtheria that is causing the, um, the croup here. This is extremely rare in the United States or the North America in general. Um, it's going it, it, to be presented with a gray-white pharyngeal membrane, which may cover the soft palate. Uh, it bleeds easily. 
don't forget that diphtheria is a uh, notifiable disease. Okay, so that is a highlighted fact here, that diphtheria is a notifiable disease. We should notify uh, uh, if, that the patient has diphtheria here. Uh, the second is going to be foreign body aspiration. Uh, what we should look for is a sudden choking or coughing without really warn any warning. Uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, the patient is going to have drooling and difficulty swallowing. Uh, extrinsic compression, uh, like a vascular ring or something like that, um, or an interluminal obstruction, um, like a mass or anything. The patient is going to have uh, is going to have a continued uh, continued symptoms and does not improve with treatment. So we give treatment and the patient is not really getting better. Well, we should think about an extrinsic compression, something that is compressing his airways, either a vascular ring or something that has to do with the inside, the interluminal obstruction, like a mass. Uh, an angioedema, this is, um, this is easier to suspect, is going to be due to allergic reaction. So a trigger is given in such a, in, in a case. Uh, we manage it with steroids and epinephrine. If severe, we can intubate the patient for airway obstruction. Angioedema is mediated by bradykinin. And this peptide increases the permeability of the vasculature, leading to the accumulation of fluid. Pretty easy stuff so far. The uh, final is going to be pertussis. And uh, it says the pertussis is going to be severe cough that develops after one to two weeks with characteristic whoop. And um, spells of cough. The, we should look for a child with incomplete immunization history. A fun fact, I actually got pertussis one time. I was a medical student and I got pertussis. Um, I don't know why I'm saying that, but it might help you remember something. Uh, and it, it really has that characteristic whooping cuff, and um, I'll never forget it. I, um, um, it is very distinctive for me. All right, so moving on. We have a question here, and it says a toddler uh, presents to the emergency center with a sudden onset respiratory distress. The mother reports that the child was uh, without any symptoms playing with his Legos. Okay, if he says Legos, right away I'm gonna th I'm gonna think the um, um, the foreign body aspiration in the living room with her siblings. On physical examination, the patient is drooling and in moderate respiratory distress. So far, that still is foreign body aspiration. No, uh, the drooling doesn't have to do with, uh, with the, um, the foreign body aspiration. Okay, let's continue. And in moderate respiratory distress, there are decreased breath sounds on the right with intercostal retraction. Okay, this is still the foreign body aspiration. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Then it says antibiotics. I'm going to say no, of course. Uh, bronchoscopy, and um, this could be a valid option. Chest X-ray, cricothyroidotomy, and throat cultures. Well, cricothyroidotomy is going to help much because um, we have it in, in the um, uh, uh, we have decreased in breath sounds on the right side, so I'm going to think the right bronchus, right main bronchus, is obstructed. And the cricothyroidotomy is going to help. Throat cultures, they're not going to help. So it's either chest X-ray to um, to confirm or bronchoscopy, and we should do probably bronchoscopy right away because this is really clear um so yeah and yes the answer is b it's uh, bronchoscopy okay so this is indicated both to visualize a suspected foreign body and for the foreign body retrieval if there is significant respiratory distress and hypoxemia emergency cricothyroid may maybe may be indicated uh, foreign bodies are found most commonly in children less than four years Okay, so I was wrong when it had to do with the cricothyroidotomy here. Um, but it is indicated, but it's just um, uh, it is in, uh, in, in severe respiratory distress along with hypoxemia. So we can do that. Okay. Finally, it says recurrent infections in a young child should always raise the suspicion of previously undiagnosed aspiration. Hmm, okay, uh, we should get a chest x-ray to look for the post obstruction at the Lexus or visualization of the foreign body. So a chest x-ray can be used in this case. Very good. All right, uh, we have a, um, a, a note on the side that says that the most common sites of foreign body aspiration are either one in children, 
of more than one year, it's going to be the larynx. If the child is less than one year, we're going to see it in the trachea or the right main stem bronchus. So more than one year, it's going to be the larynx. Less than one year, it's going to be the trachea or the right main stem bronchus. All right, very good. So we're done with this part. Let's go to the next. We have an inflammation of the right, of the small airways. And the first one is going to be bronchiolitis. Um, bronchiolitis here, the, patho the pathophysiology of bronchiolitis is as follows. First, that is going to, we're going to have the respiratory syncytial virus uh, in 50% of cases. Uh, we can have parainfluenza virus, adenovirus, or other viruses here. But respiratory syncytial virus is the most, uh, most common one. The bronchioles are the smallest part of the airways, which are less than one millimeter, uh, and terminate at the alveoli. They have ciliated cupoidal epithelium of a layer of smooth muscle. So far, those things are known and easy. Uh, bronchioles change in diameter and can reduce or increase the airflow. All right. Well, we have a lovely picture here. Uh, that shows the bronchioles and um, and the vasculature and the alveoli and so on. Um, finally, here it says that uh, bronchiolitis results in inflammation, which results in ball valve obstruction, uh, which results in air trapping and overinflation. <clears throat> so the ball valve obstruction means that the air goes in, but it just doesn't really go out, and um, and the overinflation occurs. Before I go on, um, we had a note on the side that says that the best prevention against bronchiolitis is breastfeeding. Ah, okay. That's, uh, that's a good piece of information I didn't know about. So the best prevention is, uh, is breastfeeding. Clostrum is particularly rich in IgA and protects against bronchiolitis. Very good. Okay, so uh, how is the patient going to be uh, uh, presented? Well, the, the classic presentation is a child, less than two years of age, uh, most of even children, one to two months, uh, with the following symptoms in fall and winter months. So it's, it's seasonal. Uh, first, it's going to be a mild upper respiratory tract, uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, it's going to have fever, pro, um, uh, paroxysmal, uh, wheezy cough, dyspnea, tachypnea, apnea, sometimes in young infants, and on exam, there are wheezing and prolonged expirations. Okay, so it's a classic presentation of a respiratory tract infection, along with the upper respiratory tract infection symptoms and some lower respiratory tract infection symptoms. Okay, so um, very good. Now the diagnostic testing. So the um, the diagnostic testing here the um, the um, the diagnosis is going to be clinical uh, with the symptoms that we talked about before, and this is going to be follow a following test that we could also perform uh, is going to be first the best initial test is going to be a chest X-ray, and this is going to show the hyperinflation with the, the patchy atlexis and may look like an early pneumonia sometimes. Uh, the most specific test, however, is the viral antigen testing. Uh, we can do ELISA or IFA uh, of the nasopharyngeal secretions. So we can take that and do a viral antigen testing. How about the treatment? Well, the treatment is actually supportive only. We can hospitalize if there is severe tachypnea. Um, the defin by definition, more than 60 per minute. More than 60. Uh, respiratory rate is more than 60 per minute. Uh, if there is pyrexia and intercostal retractions are present, those would indicate that there is some severity. Uh, we give a trial of beta agonist nebulizers that could help. And most importantly, steroids are not indicated. We talked about steroids before and what had to do with the um, with the croup and epiglottitis. Uh, we said that we give steroids in case of uh, epiglottitis along with the antibiotics and we give steroids along with epinephrine as nebulizers in croup. But in such cases as bronchiolitis, we do not give steroids. How about prevention? Well, in, in high-risk patients only, uh, we can give hyperimmune, um, um, by giving hyperimmune uh, respiratory syncytial virus IVIG or monoclonal antibodies to the respiratory syncytial virus F protein, uh, pali, palivizumab. 
So those two things we can use. Uh, a high risk patients would uh, include with the um, patient include those with the bronchopulmonary dysplasia and those born preterm. So those are two of the high risk patients that we can use those for. So if the stem of the question says that we have a patient who is preterm, well, we should give him the hyperimmune uh, respiratory syncytial virus IVJG or the monoclonal antibody to the respiratory syncytial virus F protein. Very important here. And, and general prevention methods include hand washing, avoiding um, secondhand smoke, and avoiding sick contact. Secondhand smoke? Okay. All right. Um, we have a note on the side that says ribavirin has not been shown to have clinical benefit and is generally not recommended. So we, we, we shouldn't really give an antiviral like that. Okay. And that has been bronchiolitis. Okay, how about pneumonia here? Let's talk about pneumonia for a little bit. The classic presentation of pneumonia uh, is going to be different. It depends on the causative organism. So we have either it's a viral pneumonia, uh, we can have bacterial pneumonia, and we can have chlamydia trichomatis. So the, um, the viral pneumonia, this is most common cause uh, in children less than five years. Uh, and most commonly, again, the respiratory syncytial virus. We have upper respiratory tract infections, low-grade fever, and tachypnea. And this is going to be the most consistent finding, actually, the kidney. We're going to see the kidney in such case. And um, in Egypt here, this is just a side note, we have something called IMCI. And we would diagnose pneumonia just by seeing a patient who has uh, low-grade fever or just fever in general, along with the kidney. If we see that, it's pneumonia until proven otherwise. So you, you might correlate with that uh, viral pneumonia symptoms here. Okay, so a bacterial type of pneumonia, this is most common in children more than five years. So less than five years, this has to do with the viral one. More than five years, it's bacterial. Less than five, viral. More than five, bacterial. Uh, most commonly, it's going to be strep pneumonia. Of course, it's called pneumonia. And uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, again. And uh, chlamydia pneumonia. Not trichomatis. That's different. Okay. The, uh, the symptom is going to be acute onset, um, sudden shaking chills, high fever. That's different from the low grade one in viral. There's going to be a prominent cough. There's going to be a pleuritic chest pain. Um, and a child more than five years, he can say that he has chest pain. That's um, um, So that's one more thing. Markedly diminished breath sounds and dullness to percussion. So this is the the full package here. How pneumonia? We think of pneumonia in general when you see uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the classic presentation. Finally, the chlamydia trichomatis in infants one to three months of age with insidious onset, uh, usually more than uh, three weeks. It takes more than three weeks. We're going to see no fever or wheezing, and this is going to be distinguish it from the respiratory syncytial virus here. And plus or minus, we're going to see conjunctivitis at birth. Chlamydia trichomatis causes conjunctivitis. Now, uh, the classic virus are staccato cough and peripheral eosinophilia. It's just a, the, the chlamydia trichomatis here is a little bit different, it's like extremely different from the others. Um, first of all, no fever. So pneumonia in a, in a, in a presence of no fever is going to be weird. Uh, and we're not going to see the wheeze, and that's going to be really weird as well. And we're going to see conjunctivitis. So we're looking for really different things here. And the classic find is going to be the staccato cough and the peripheral eosinophilia. So kind of hard to diagnose and, uh, and uh, so and and, and, uh, and such um, again infants one to three months of age with insidious onset which takes more than three weeks right. okay so um, a diagnostic testing in in cases like that well it's gonna be chest x-ray we talked in the um, uh, bronchiolitis that the best initial test is gonna be chest x-ray I believe in the, the um, pneumonia is gonna be the same what we're going to see here, uh, in viral infection, it's going to be hyperinflation with, bi with bilateral uh, interstitial infiltrates and um, peribronchial cuffing. The pneumococcal is going to be confluent uh, luber cons uh, consolidation. And um, just going back to the viral here, I don't think we can really um, can distinguish those. 
um, um, that from the um, from the bronchiolitis, and uh, we mentioned before that it's hard to um, to distinguish those because the um, the bronchiolitis uh, might might look like early pneumonia. So just bear that in mind. Uh, the chest X-ray is not conclusive. And um, again, okay. So going back to mycoplasma or chlamydia, uh, it's going to be unilateral uh, luber, uh, lower lobe interstitial pneumonia, and it looks worth worse than the presentation here. Next, we can do the CBC with differential and viral. Usually, it's going to be less than 20,000. Bacteria is going to be 15,000 to 40,000, uh, the, the um, um, white blood cell count. Uh, we can do viral antigens, uh, IgM titers for the mycoplasma again. Uh, we can do blood cultures. Um, I, I think there is a test called the cold agnotinines we can do for the mycoplasma. And um, But yeah, I mean... Um, it's 50% of cases. It doesn't really um, have a positive result, but it's just worth noting. Worth noting. Okay, so it says that CCS tip. I know this is uh, this is not for step two, but just in case you might have uh, some extra information. But in cases of pneumonia, do not order sputum cultures. They are of no help in the management of pneumonia in children. Okay, all right. So sputum cultures not helpful. Good to know. Okay, so treatment on an outpatient case uh, or an outpatient course is going to be a mild case, of course. We can give amoxicillin. This is the best choice. Uh, and we can give alternatives like uh, sevoruxime and amoxicillin clovulonic acid. Uh, hospitalized, we're going to give IV uh, sevoruxime if the staph aureus. We would add vancomycin. Uh, if the viral origin suspected, we may withhold the antibiotic, of course. However, Give antibiotics if the child deteriorates. Uh, up to 30% may have coexisting bacteria pathogen. Oh, okay. In chlamydia and mycoplasma, we give erythromycin or other macrolides. Okay, let's just uh, recap on the treatment part here. We have uh, four cases that we might give different treatments for. Uh, we have the outpatient versus the hospitalized versus the viral and chlamydia or mycoplasma. Let's just get rid of the easy ones. Chlamydia or mycoplasma, we give erythromycin, not any type of microlides. Um, in outpatient case, we give amoxicillin, or we can give sevoruxime or amoxicillin clovulonic acid, like augmentin. And now we have two cases here, the uh, hospitalized case and if there is a viral origin suspected. Um, in general, if we have a viral origin, we should we may um, stop the antibiotics in such case. And but if the case deteriorates when we stop the antibiotics, we should continue uh, the antibiotics again and put the patient on them because thirty percent of cases they might have both the bacteria and the viral infections. And finally, hospitalized, we're going to give IV sevoruxime if we suspect that there is a staph aureus or what if we do blood culture and it's positive for a staph aureus, we add vancomycin. Okay, all right, so far so easy. Uh, we are done with pneumonia here. Now let's move on to a CF or cystic fibrosis. Uh, we're almost done. Cystic fibrosis is the last disease in uh, respiratory um, section. Okay, so we begin with the question here, and the question says a three year old white female presents with erectile prolapse. She is noted to be in the less than 5 percentile for weight and height. So she is underweight and she, uh, her height is not really developing well. The parents also note that she has a foul-smelling bulky stool each day that floats. So this has to do with a more increase in or has to do with the pancreatic enzymes. Um, they also state that the child has developed a repetitive cuff over the last few months. Again. This points to cystic fibrosis. What is the first step in workup in this patient? And it says here genetic testing. That's not the first thing to do. Uh, pulmonary function tests, not going to help much. Uh, rectal biopsy, well, this is if we suspect that he, ha she or he has uh, um, hair sprung disease, so no. Uh, stool studies, not going to really do anything. And sweat chloride is the answer here. So the sweat chloride test is the best initial test to diagnose cystic fibrosis here. Um, 
It says that cystic fibrosis is an autosomal or uh, recessively inherited disease, and it's caused by a mutation in the CFTR gene. Okay, CFTR gene, uh, and uh, the body regulates sweat and mucus by channeling water and chloride through a specific protein. So we have a protein here, and that protein channeling the water and the chloride through that and that's how we re regulate the sweat and the mucus the cftr gene controls expression of this protein and in cystic fibrosis the malfunction in protein does not allow the chloride to flow through so we don't really have chloride and the blocked channel causes a buildup of thick mucus So the thick mucus here is what causes all the presentations in general. The most common initial presentation of cystic fibrosis is the meconium ileus. Uh, other signs and symptoms that warrant the workup for cystic fibrosis are fills. First, the failure to thrive from malabsorption, steatorrhea due to the pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, vitamin A, D, E, and K deficiency, Okay, uh, rectal prolapse, and this is most often in infants with steatorrhea, malnutrition, and cough. Persistent cough in the first year of life with the, the copious purulent mucus production. Very good uh, three uh, things to notice in any patient in the stem, and that would indicate that he has or she has cystic fibrosis. Other associated conditions are uh, undescended testes, uh, infertility, absent or vast deference, but we're not going to see infertility in children here. So, And allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Okay, very good. Um, we have a side note that says that meconium ileus occurs in 10% of patients. We look for abdominal distension at birth, failure to pass meconium, and bilious vomiting. That's going to be the meconium ileus here. Okay. Diagnostic testing, we said the best initial test and the most specific one is two elevated sweat chloride concentrations, more than 60 milli equivalent per liter, obtained on separate days. The genetic testing we can do is highly accurate, of course, but it does not detect all chromosome 7 mutations. It is done to detect carrier status and for prenatal diagnosis. So it's not really to diagnose the patient. It's more to diagnose the carrier status and prenatal diagnosis here. Uh, newborn screening will uh, um, determine the immunoreactive trypsinogen in blood spots and then confirm with the sweat or DNA testing. Okay, I didn't know the newborn screening part here before. I know the other ones, but uh, I didn't know that one. So what we're going to do, do we determine the immunoreactive trypsinogen in blood spots. All right, okay. The... Um, a chest x-ray uh, is helpful in monitoring course of disease and acute exacerbations. Uh, and finally, pulmonary function testing is not done until the age of 5 or 6 to evaluate the disease progression if it goes from obstructive to restrictive. All right. Now, how about the treatment here? Okay, for the treatment here, well, supportive care consists of aerosol treatment, albuterol saline, uh, chest physical therapy with the postural drainage, um, pancreolibase, which aids digestion in patients with pancreatic dysfunction. So all we do here is just um, symptomatic treatment of supportive care here in general, uh, and uh, it has to do with the aerosol treatment to, or albuterol saline for bronchodilation, uh, chest physical therapy for drainage of the mucus, the thick mucus that we have, and replacing of the pancreatic uh, enzymes or the lipase. The, uh, we have a first approved cystic fibrosis therapy uh, that restores the function of a mutant cystic fibrosis protein, and it, uh, its name is Evacaftor. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. Um, Evacaftor or something like that. Well, anyways, it's uh, VX770. And this is kind of like the code, I think, uh, or the, um, the, um, the active ingredient name. But uh, you can look it up for yourself, and uh, this is the first approved cystic fibrosis therapy that restores the function of a mutant cystic fibrosis protein. Uh, it is recommended for all patients age 6 and older who carry at least one copy of the G551D mutation 
And the G55 uh, 1D mutation is present in 5% of cystic fibrosis patients, actually. And it interferes with the activation of the CFTR chloride channel. All cystic fibrosis patients should undergo genotyping to determine whether they have that or not. So this is really important. So it's not all patients with cystic fibrosis would actually take that drug, only who has the at least one copy of the G55 1D mutation. Uh, it has been shown to decrease sweat chloride levels, improve the FEV1, decrease pulmonary symptoms and exorbations, and improve. So this is good news, but only for 5% of cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, the most common organism that cause infection in cystic fibrosis are the uh, Staph aureus, H. influenza, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the following treatment have been shown um, uh, and, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, we have the following treatments and that I'm going to talk about, and they have shown to improve survival. Uh, there are three. Ibuprofen azithromycin and antibiotics. Uh, ibuprofen, uh, this reduces the inflammatory lung response and slows the patient's decline. Uh, azithromycin slows the rate of decline in FEV1 uh, in patients less than 13 years. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, antibiotics, uh, during exacerbation, they will delay the progression of lung disease. So again, azithromycin, but it's less than uh, in, in patients who are less than 13 years of age. Ibuprofen to decrease the lung response, inflammatory lung response, and antibiotics to de during the exacerbations. Okay, beautiful. Now let's see the antibiotics that we can use to treat cystic fibrosis in a mild disease going to be different than a documented infection with Pseudomonas or Staph aureus from a resistant pathogen. In the first, the mild disease, we give macrolide, ciprofloxacin. In a documented infection with Pseudomonas or Staph aureus, we'll, we'll treat aggressively with piperacillin plus tubromycin or ceftazidine. Ceftazidine. So again, in mild case, just give macrolide, trimethoprim sulfamethexazole or ciprofloxacin. If we have a documented infection with pseudomonas uh, or if we have uh, uh, staph aureus, we treat aggressively. But what we're going to treat with, we're going to treat with piperacillin plus topromycin or ceftazidine. If we have a resistant pathogen, we use the inhaled topromycin. Okay, for the management uh, considerations here that we give all routine vaccinations plus the pneumococcal and yearly flu vaccines. Uh, we never delay antibiotic therapy even if fever and trachipnea are not uh, are absent. Uh, steroids will they improve the pulmon pulmonary function tests in the short term, but there is no persistent benefit when steroids are stopped. Um, so um, it just doesn't really help to have a long-term effect for steroids. It just has to do with short-term effect. Uh, expectorants uh, are not effective in the removal of respiratory secretions. So if you give them, they're not going to help much. And that's been cystic fibrosis, and that's been uh, respiratory disease. So to recap, we talked about respiratory uh, fibrosis. We talked about pneumonia. Uh, we talked the bronchiolitis, and um, we talked about the general conditions in respiratory disease like croup, epiglottitis, trichitis, foreign body aspiration, and, um, and pertussis, and so on. Um, all right, that's been it for this section. Uh, we did uh, really well, and I, I'm going to take a short break of five minutes, and we're going to be back with cardiology. Uh, and um, All right, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.